On February 9, 1950, in Wheeling, West Virginia, over 275 members of the Republican Women's Club of Ohio County had just enjoyed their annual Lincoln Day dinner and were ready to hear their keynote speech from a relatively unknown junior senator from Wisconsin. A single reporter from a local paper was covering the event. It was a meager stage, but the speech that Senator Joseph R. McCarthy was about to deliver would make him one of the most powerful and feared men in the country. McCarthy raised a wad of papers and declared, I have here in my hand a list of 205 names that were known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party, and who, nevertheless, are still working and shaping the policy of the State Department. The list was a fraud, it was actually a four-year-old letter, but McCarthy's message was clear. His accusations of communism running rampant within the U.S. government elevated McCarthy to a powerful position in American politics. His ability to manipulate both the media and the American fear of communism led to his tragic grip on the people of the United States. However, the rise of an influential new medium, television, led to his downfall and the ultimate triumph of American values. Joseph McCarthy had a record of lying in order to manipulate events. During his second campaign for Senate, McCarthy drew upon his service with the United States Marine Corps and styled himself Tailgunner Joe. However, he often exaggerated his service record, even telling stories of a war wound that he actually received during an initiation ceremony. McCarthy beat out his opponent, Robert La Follette Jr., by just 5,000 votes in the 1946 elections. McCarthy was unpopular amongst the other senators, and he often kept to himself. He knew he would have to devote himself to a cause in order to keep his seat in the Senate. This cause would be communism, and starting with his speech in Wheeling, McCarthy would begin a four-year crusade that turned America's fear into personal power. A combination of factors and prior events led to Americans' fear of communism. Americans living during the 1950s remembered the founding of the Soviet Union and the first Red Scare of 1919, where workers, reeling from the effects of the post-war economy, held strikes that were labeled as communist uprisings. They remembered the Great Depression, where the United States was in a state of economic crisis. They had just finished World War II, where Americans made great personal sacrifices to keep the world safe from tyranny. They were living during the Cold War, in which the two major ideologies of the world, Western democracy and Eastern socialism, were clashing for the first time. The Soviets had just created and tested their own nuclear bomb in 1949, and America had just entered the Korean War. Americans had also seen Julius and Ethel Rosenberg tried as Soviet spies, and State Department official Alger Hiss convicted of communist-related perjury. The United States was in a position of prosperity for the first time in decades, and Americans did not want their newfound wealth to be taken away from them by the communists. This made Joseph McCarthy's claim that America had communists in its own government so shocking and compelling to the American people. After McCarthy's speech at Wheeling, his message started to spread throughout America. What started as a single article by Frank Desmond in the Wheeling Intelligencer spread through newspapers across the country, and soon, McCarthy and his controversial yet exciting issue became famous nationwide. The raw, harsh, unpleasant fact is that communism is an issue, and will be an issue in 1954. Before long, the public was clamoring for names, not numbers, and McCarthy was happy to provide them. He dug back years, or even decades, to find links between members of the government and organizations that the government had declared as communist. In 1953, McCarthy was able to further his agenda by becoming the chairman of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. The Subcommittee on Investigations was concerned with finding and trying members of government for communism. McCarthy often browbeat his witnesses and included evidence that was exaggerated or even false. It seemed as if McCarthy's reign would continue for years or decades, if not for a medium that would revolutionize the way the world thought about news and entertainment. During the time that McCarthy was rising to power, the television was also gaining popularity. Due to better picture quality and more programs being broadcast by the major networks, more and more televisions were finding their way into American households. Television allowed audiences to see what happened, rather than just hear it. The news spread faster than ever, and Americans were able to form personal connections and look right into the eyes of the newscasters and newsmakers. Television gave Americans a whole new perspective on entertainment and the news, and it was this medium that would break McCarthy's commanding grip on American politics. His downfall would start with Edward R. Murrow, a charismatic news reporter and anchorman of the popular radio show Hear It Now. 
In 1952, with television becoming more and more common amongst Americans, Murrow switched media and started See It Now, a news program broadcast on CBS, where Murrow would investigate an issue in depth for 30 minutes. Murrow's first stand against McCarthy was The Case of Milo Radulovich, which aired in October 1953. In the program, Murrow investigated why Radulovich, a lieutenant in the Air Force, was classified as a communist security risk and discharged after 10 years of loyal service. Radulovich was a victim of guilt by association. He was accused because of his continued relationship with his father and sister, who had read communist literature. The image of the seemingly innocent, common man at the hands of McCarthy's power made Americans start to question the motives behind the McCarthy-run communist witch hunt, and Radulovich was reinstated one month after the broadcast. Murrow would strike a more direct blow to McCarthy in March 1954, when he ran a program entitled A Report on Senator Joseph McCarthy. In the program, he visually exposed McCarthy as a political bully who took advantage of people for his own gain. Many Americans who had only read about McCarthy in newspapers finally had a chance to see the way he operated. Murrow also added his own opinion with soliloquies that rang like poetry. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create this situation of fear, he merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Good night, and good luck. The program generated more calls and letters from the public than any show in See It Now history. A month later, Murrow and his producer, Fred W. Friendly, hosted McCarthy on See It Now to defend himself and his methods. However, the American public, who had already formed a trusting relationship with Murrow, was not impressed by McCarthy's brash style and hardly photogenic appearance. Through the new visual medium of television, Murrow's programs helped to illustrate McCarthy's true personality and techniques. However, the true final blow to Joseph McCarthy's political career came at the Army-McCarthy hearings, in which the Army, whom McCarthy had accused of using blackmail and bribery, accused McCarthy and his aide Roy Cohn, of trying to get privileged treatment for Cohn's friend, Private G. David Shine. Every minute of the Army McCarthy hearings was televised live on ABC, and it became a great public spectacle. Viewers tuning in to the Army McCarthy hearings were treated to great drama and memorable characters. The hearings were America's first reality show. Department stores were selling out of TVs, and during the time the Army McCarthy hearings aired, two-thirds of all televisions in the country were tuned into them. All in all, 184 hours of footage were recorded, and the transcript of the event was 7,300 pages and over 2 million words long. The star of the hearings was mild-mannered lawyer Joseph Welsh, who was representing the Army. As the hearings wore on, McCarthy charged young lawyer Fred Fisher, a member of Welsh's legal team, with being associated with communism. In response, Welsh would deliver some of the most powerful words ever spoken on national television. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Let's, let's, let's You've let's done let's enough. Let's Have let's you let's no let's sense let's of decency, sir? At long last. Have you left no sense of decency? <laughs> I will not discuss it further. I will not ask Mr. Cohen any more witnesses. You, Mr. Chairman, may, if you will, call the next witness. With those words, McCarthy's firm hold on the American people collapsed. As Fisher himself later wrote, the retort of Joe Welsh is history, and there are many who say that his eloquence was not only the turning point of the hearings, but of the movement headed by Senator McCarthy. Within the year, McCarthy would be censured by the Senate, and he lost all political reputation and many of his friends. Three years later, McCarthy died of liver failure. He had drunk himself to death the tragic rise and fall of Joe McCarthy was over. The short four-year reign of Joseph McCarthy was a tragic time for the United States. Americans were held in the grasp of their own fear of communism and let themselves and their First Amendment freedoms be manipulated and restricted. However, it was television which emerged as the force that would bring McCarthy down. The efforts of men such as Edward Murrow and Joseph Welsh facilitated a triumphant liberation for those held in McCarthy's grasp. The rise of television helped end Joseph McCarthy's firm grip on the American people by taking away his mystique and exposing him as the demagogue that he really was.